What's up, Houston? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I know. I'm right? in my house. <laughs> Look, I'm enjoying this, but I'm I'm actually missing the studio. I was kind of yeah. feeling myself when we were in the studio. Well, I actually rode by there the other day, and it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't bad. I'm not sure the the other ways you guys were coming. Um, because I had to go over that way uh, last week, and it was it was okay. This was okay for me, but this seems like Zoom call, and you know, when I'm in the studio, you know, I'm kind of. I'm feeling myself. You're a little looser. You're a little looser. So I don't, I don't know if I would be able to do this for the whole rest of the year. So I think I want us to consider going back into the studio a little bit. Okay. okay. She just want to put your feel on us. That's okay. I, I know that's right. Look, 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 look. She, she want to do what I always tell my husband. She want to keep it spicy. She uh, just want to keep it spicy. <laughs> well, because you know what? Because when I'm when I'm doing it here like this, I'm I'm at the office, or I have to run home. I'm scared the internet gonna fail. So I just like that studio feel. I mean, like we really, really on the radio. Yeah. So. Well, I, I think this is a, what what this has shown us is that we have some flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. So we can get back into the studio. But but the other thing is obviously, even if one of us has something going on, we're not in town, so we can still zoom in, even if everybody else is in the yeah. studio. So yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just talking. Look, we get into that traffic one time. I'm not coming back. So. <laughs> no, <see? laughs> She, she, she told a big game right now. <laughs> so look at it for our July. I'm gonna make sure too. We um, I get our July roundup um out to everybody as well. So excited about July. Well, what mm -hmm. we talking about? And Nicole, I saw I meant to respond to your text. I got to get your the information on who you got lined up for our July um date as well. Oh yeah, I put a lot of pressure on the girl in July. I'd already start working out. That's good. I don't know. Me too. I, I saw to your that. picture like when you were sitting over. I was like, uh, girl, you, was said, you were sweating up something on you. You was mad. It looked like she was mad. You were mad. I was. I was. <laughs> <laughs> but, I felt, but I felt good afterwards. So uh -huh. it felt, the burn felt good. But Where'd you work out, Tawana? At home? At home. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I so, got so what, what, was that like? what did you start out with since this was you starting back up? What did you do? I started out with the uh, tread climber, and then I got um, the the stepper, and then I got the um, kettlebell. Then I got the um, I got me a hula hoop. <laughs> I got I have uh, a jump rope. Um, so I got quite a few. I got quite a few things. Um, Girl, look, have Mr. Jimmy, please record the next time you're doing the hula hoop and send it in the group chat, please. <laughs> That's my favorite. I love the hula hoop. So if I think about the hula hoop, I think of some boy when she say, shh, shh. But you know what? <laughs> Actually, when I, first started, when I first started using it again, because I ordered one of those weighted hula hoops. And when I first started using it, I couldn't keep it up. I kept saying, I know I know how to hula hoop. And I thought about her and I was like, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so. and look, you know you got enough back there to make Ooh, sure you no. stay up now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you, ladies. I'm so excited to be hosting tonight's show. This is our last night for June Jubilee, mm -hmm. where we will feature one of my own homegirls, Angela Chapman, the author of The Ball Truth. Um, actually, when I first read um, Angela's book, the first impression of the book, looking at the title and looking at the picture, I had pictured something totally, totally mm -hmm. different. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just briefly describe her, you know, introduce her and then come in and let her um, take it over from there. And we're we'll asking some questions okay. Okay. Um, about the author, Angela Chapman. And I'm going to hold up her book so people can kind of see it. Can they see right it? I can yeah, see it right there. Okay. okay. Angela Chapman is a native of Greenville, Mississippi, who now resides in Fort Worth, Texas. She's a mother, author, and entrepreneur. When she's not motivating, 
encouraging and inspiring others. She managed an online clothing website. She designs custom gift baskets, and she serves as a member of the Britney's Backpack Ministry. She has received numerous awards and honors, which includes headline mentors and performing arts, wardrobe stylists, award for the video depression, the Strong Women Award, and Where Are You? She does Outreach Volunteer Certificate Appreciation Award. She was um, has an award from Tragedy to Triumph, the Rise of a Change Breaker Honoree, and she has also been featured in an exclusive story in the Southern Dallas Business and Living Magazine. Oh, yeah. 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 Just a little background um, of Angela. Angela and I are both from uh, Greenville, Mississippi. Angela graduated in 1986, and I graduated in 1987. And so we would see each other all the time. Um, we were never in the same circle of friends, but we were very cordial once we saw each other. Mm -hmm. And so you all boss chicks know I hadn't been on social media that long. Right. And so when I, oh, um, when I first, when y'all push me, because <laughs> I didn't jump, I was pushed. When you all push me into the social media world, um, Angela came up, I saw the book and my heart immediately went out, you know, to her. And so I was thinking something totally totally different than what the book actually um, gave me. And so um, I don't want to give too much away without, you know, her being a part of it, but just so you all, you know, kind of know what made me to re reach out to Angela. I just reached out to her through, you know, a message like, hey, um, I want to order your book. And so I ordered the book and from there, everything took off. We started communicating. Um, Angela is someone that I hadn't seen in about 35 years, wow. 35 years. Um, mm -hmm. So without further ado, we're going to bring to stage Angela Chapman, the author. Hey. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> well, thank you, Angela, for joining us. I know you've heard a lot about my girls. You know, I talk about the boss chicks of Houston all the time. And so these are the boss chicks of Houston, Deanna Green, which is actually the founder of the platform, um, Boss Chicks. Um, Nicole Wilson is the boss chick, mm -hmm. and Keisha White. <laughs> so hey. one, thing, one thing about the boss chicks, our platform is built on empowering other women, um, being raw, authentic women. Um, we do whatever we could, we utilize our resources. Um, we eat off each other plates, uh, whatever we can do to help the next lady. And so we are so honored, I am at least, to be able to present you as one of our June Jubilees, uh, one of my own homegirls. Um, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Love you too. So uh, before we begin, I give you, I did a brief introduction of you, but I give you the opportunity to tell um, the listeners other things about you because I did leave out a few things to allow you to be able to introduce yourself as well. Well, I, I was listening to you um, go over a few other things. So um, I'm gonna try to jump in and think I can grab on a few of them that, I, that were missed out. Um, the wardrobe stylist, um, ghostwriter, content developer, um, editor. I think that was those you missed. I didn't say those and I didn't say those on purpose. I wanted you to say those. I did know those. Exactly, exactly. And I'm also an Oscomate, which a lot of people don't know because they don't know, you know, what that actually is unless they actually dealing with it themselves. So yes, okay. I'm an advocate for um, the Awesome Association. Okay. Um, like I previously said, Angela, when I saw your book, the title and the picture of the book, it led me, when I first saw it, it honestly led me to feel empathy. And when I mean, when I said I felt empathy, the first thing I thought with you being bald and then the title being the bald truth, I said to myself, oh my God, my homegirl has cancer. So when I talked with you and I actually got the book, it was something totally, totally different. And so 
when each and every person does something, it's always a why, why we do it. And so my first question to you was, um, to you is, why, and it's kind of a two-parted question, why and what made it mo motivated you to write this book and why did you decide to write this book now? Well, for a majority of my life, I've always maintained journals. Uh, it was kind of my outlet from a lot of things that I had actually experienced. Um, but I had always wanted to write a book. Um, I just didn't know when um, the time would present itself for me to be able to do it. It wasn't until I was featured in the um, Southern Dallas Magazine back in 2016 um, because people had been following me on social media because I became transparent and started telling my journey, started telling my story, just that this chapter seven part, the, the journey to live, that was the only part that I was revealing at the time. And then so uh, once I, I actually did exclusive in 2016 in the magazine, I only featured and talked about that particular part of my life. But then from there, I went ahead and decided to write the book. I said, why not tell my whole truth? Because mm. people, I want people just thinking my truth is just what the, you know, the illness that I was going through at that particular time. Mm, okay. Um, one thing again, once I said about on the boss chicks, I mean, you know, podcasts, we're real authentic women, you know, we're transparent. Um, we say a lot. And after reading your book, um, so much hit home and so much of it was real. I can actually relate to it being that I was there at the time it was going on and wasn't aware that it was going on. And so if it was that real to me, it had to be real to your family. And so my next question is, um, how or did this even, when you wrote this book, did it have any impact on the relationship you had with family members after writing this book? Um, because you, you were real, you, you said what happened. And so, you know, with being brought up in the South, you know, you learn what goes on in the house stays in the house, but you told it, you told it off, told it all. So how, how are your relationship with your family, you know, with that, with your mom, you know, with, with your uncle and other people that was involved in this book? Well, strangely, the impact there was there wasn't one at all, and and I sort of say um, based that on because um, if you read, for people who have read the book, not to give too much away, the dynamics of the household um, was basically dysfunction, you know, and so we were there, there was never um, a time where we were taught you know, love or affection, acknowledgement, anything like that, communication. And mm -hmm. so when this happened, you know, when I did the book, there was no impact at all. It's basically everything that transcended, like the way we grew up, it just, that has been, the continuation has gone on through our adulthood life. Well, and you know, and, and it's it funny that you said that because just remembering back to that time when I would see you in school. Like I said, we never ran into the same circle. You were always that light-skinned girl, always smiling, always laughing with the bow legs. Mm -hmm. I mean, no one, you know, on the outside, you know, looking in could ever tell or even imagine that you were actually going through the things that you were going through. And it, it, it I mean, how, how could you just hold, hold back and just cover up all the pain with, with the smiles. It was something that was really very hard to do. But you know, some you know how when you're a parent and you tell your you tell your children like if anybody ever does anything to you, you know, you're always it's always good to tell an adult. You know what I'm saying? We teach right. our children that. And then so when you're told that and you tell an adult somebody who you think you can confide, can confide in and that they, they'll keep this secret or someone who you think can protect or save you or keep you safe. And that person doesn't do that. Then, you know, you know, there, there, for me, I knew that there was no other, no, no other outlet. So, you know, I couldn't be the person that I was at home. I couldn't be that person at school. 
School for me was an outlet, so I couldn't bring that depressed, sad, all the things that I was experiencing that that person, I can bring her to school because I didn't feel those things when I was at school. I, I felt safe at school, you know? Mm -hmm. I had friends at school. I had people that, you know, related to me, you know? I didn't have to, to have to be, bring that sad person to school. So any, and, and I know we didn't, we didn't discuss this yesterday when we spoke briefly, but was it any friends or any classmates that knew any of this was ever going on? Some some knew bits and pieces, but they didn't know a whole lot, you know, to the, in depth of it. You know, they just knew like the surface, but not the core. Right. And, and briefly, we spoke, uh, you know, yesterday and I was like, Angela, I kept saying, Angela, I could never imagine i couldn't even see that but then once you and i started speaking and we was talking yesterday it was like you didn't know i was a um, teenage mom you couldn't even recall that i was pregnant in school so i guess we were both so caught up in our own world and caught up in our own you know things that we were going on we couldn't even see outside our own circle that's and true so that, that 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 really really it was like, man, you know, you just really, really could never imagine what what a person actually actually going through. Now, um, I noticed, and I think we talked about it when you originally wrote this book. This book was going to be published long time ago, and and it, it didn't. So, was there ever a time or a decision that you had to make, which you had to boss up? So is, is there one of the times that you had to boss up when this book, you had put your trust in someone else to publish um, this book and that didn't go through? Yeah, that, that actually is a situation that happened. And, and for me, um, I think for me, what happened is that not having the knowledge that um, one would have in the publishing rim, you know what I'm saying, to know how the process is supposed to go. When you lack that knowledge in the in a publisher company or publicist or someone of that, you know, that nature, uh, they know that it's really, really easy to to be taken advantage of. And unfortunately, I feel victim to that. Mm. And so it became a, a situation for me where I couldn't give up, but I had to boss up. Right. And because because all of the material is mine. I'm the copyright owner. So that's what I had to do. I had to go through the process and procedures to actually become self-published and publish my book because God wanted my story to be told. Awesome. 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 Um, OK, personally, for me, I've read the book and I don't want to give um, a lot of weight um, for the people and the listeners that haven't read the book. But when I read the book, it had me on a, an emotional roller coaster. Um, it hit me so hard in my gut and it hit me in my spirit. And it was at least three chapters um, that stood out to me. And um, chapter one just took me, just took me. I mean, it took me to my knees to prayer. Um, chapter five was another chapter that got me and then chapter seven. Um, I don't want to say what it was, but I want you to count to if you can elaborate a little bit on those chapters without giving a lot of it away, because I know you still have your book signing coming on. I know you still have listeners that haven't read the book, but just can you touch on those three chapters for me? Chapter one, five and seven. Chapter one, um, actually titled Robbed of My Innocence, is actually when the journey began. That starts the whole journey. I, You know, when me telling my story, I want to tell it from the beginning, and that's where it all started. So chapter one, Robbed of My Innocence, um, basically, briefly, um, just t experiences um, with child abuse, um, sexual child abuse, and uh, um, physical, emotional, mental uh, abuse as well. Um, in that chapter. And mm -hmm. then the chapter five would be the battle with Satan. Well, that was a, I think about seven, a seven year battle um, with Satan to save my son's life who had 
several suicide attempts. And then the last one, we chapter seven, my journey to live, which is the one that I'm still continuing on uh, with my help. Okay. Um, even with, with chapter uh, five, concentrating on your son, do you think any of the things that he was going through had a lot to do with your past or things that he probably had known or had heard um, that could have led him to want to commit suicide? No, um, his, and for initially for any parent, you know, to get a phone call when you're at work that you're to come to the hospital for your child and no one gives you any other information that sends you in a whole different um, feeling that you, mm -hmm. I, can't even, I can't even begin to explain. But to get there and find out that, you know, that your child, you know, attempted suicide and that he's had, you know, he's been brought to the hospital. And then, you know, you're there for an assessment and then they're telling you that, you know, he's going to have to be going to have to stay there for weeks at a time. And, you know, you, I've never been away from him. He's never been away from me. So this was something that I could not have even, you know, you can't prepare. I couldn't prepare for as a parent. Um, I don't know if anyone else could, you know, it's just one of those things you can prepare for, but it was nothing to do with my past, but it took, it wasn't until I think his fourth, maybe his fourth, fourth suicide attempt that it was revealed through one of the counselors that his um, reason for, for wanting to end his life was because of a relationship that he had longed for to have with his biological father mm -hmm. that, you know, he didn't acknowledge him. He wanted to be acknowledged and things like that, but it had nothing to do with my past. This was something, you know, that he wanted to have a relationship with his biological father that was not given to him. And he didn't understand why, you know, somebody would, you know, not want to acknowledge him. With the with the first attempt with him of uh, suicide, was it any signs you can pick up? Any any actions or because you know we as parents we think we know our kids we try to watch for signs um but we miss them we, we can't we can't see them we can't see them and i often tell people if someone is suicidal they really don't tell you they're suicidal if someone tells you they're going to commit suicide they're not they very seldom do because for the ones that actually go through with it, they never they never share it. And so, was it any signs for you? Nothing that you could pick up on or anything? You know, unfortunately, there weren't any signs. And for I beat myself up the day at the hospital, that day at the hospital, because I was, you know, I beat myself up because I'm like, how couldn't, you know, why didn't I notice any signs? Because there weren't any signs, but, you know, right. Going through that moment, I just kept beating myself up, trying to, you know, have a think back to why, why didn't I see or why didn't I know, you know, he was in it. But we talked every day, all day long. How was your day at school? We set the dinner table. We did things that I didn't even do when I was growing up. My parents never did, right. you know, to have an interaction to, to know everything that was going on in his life. But then those things that he kept internalized, he didn't share them with me. Mm. Okay, going to chapter seven, the fight to live. Kind of touch base on that, the the health part, um, what you continue to battle with, um, and kind of educate the listeners on on that part of it. Well, um, I've been in and out of the hospital for a long, long time, for years, and then had no idea, you know, what was going on with my with my body for a long time. I thought, you know, my normal I was normal, but my normal wasn't normal. And I didn't know that. And so um, for people who um, become depending on laxatives or anything like that in order for their body to eliminate toxins, you know, um, as in the waste process, um, they that I strongly, strongly, strongly suggest that they, you know, seek out um, professional medical help, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, if that's what their body is doing, because um, I didn't depend on anything like that, but I didn't. I thought that going to the the restroom to remove toxins from my body once every four or five months 
was normal. But I met people now who say, I go two times a day or I go three times a day. And I'm like, what? What? So when I, when I hear that now after the fact, I'm like, something wrong with them. I'm not, I'm good. You know, so I'm thinking, you know, my once every three or four months and, and them going three or four times a day, now they're the ones that have a problem. You know, I never thought I was the one that had a problem medically. Correct, correct. And, and see, I can relate to that because I, I'm I'm not regular and I never have been. And to me, regular is once every five to six days. And so I'm telling people, if I'm going to the restroom twice a day, I got a virus <laughs> or, or I've been <laughs> I've been food poisoned or, or something. And so I had started, you know, depending on laxative. But girl, when I read that book, <laughs> I got so scared. I went and got me a what do you call it? colonic. I tell the people take everything waste, take it out. <laughs> I was just so so nervous, and even <laughs> they laugh. Even now, we went to Aruba, and we discussed it on our trip to Aruba. And Deanna said, "Twan, I got something for you." She said. Try some celery juice. I was drinking celery juice <laughs> in Aruba. Everybody else was talking about, I feel it. I feel it. I'm like, I drank this celery juice for three days. I still have not been to the restroom. Mm. So, Deanna, Deanna brought me two bottles of um, celery detox. I can't wait to go tomorrow. I'm fit to do five days straight detox. I drank that, that celery detox that morning and went to the bathroom and I was just praying like, hallelujah, Lord. Thank you. That's a God. Because you, you, you really don't know. You don't. You don't know. You don't know. They don't know. You know, so like I said, when I hear people that go that often, I think, oh, they have something, they have a virus. I mean, you, that's, I mean, that's to me, that's like diarrhea. You know what I'm saying? So that's what it is to go that much. But, you know, when I wasn't going, you know, once every three or four months, and then I would have to be admitted to the hospital and put to sleep, and then they would have to go and, you know, and remove it from me, remove it from my body like that. But then when I got so impacted, People were like, when your baby's doing, like, I'm not pregnant. But a lot of people don't understand a lot of that weight and carry on you. That's just toxic. It's just waste. Mm -hmm. It's needed to move from your body. When mine started coming out of my mouth, I started fecal vomiting. That's oh when I knew, you know, the doctors were like, there's something more going on here. Right. Because we, we, we serve uh, special needs children and adults. And that's one of the biggest things that they harbor on us. We have to monitor bowel movements because they have had individuals that have died from impaction. And now it's almost as if someone dies from impaction, that is considered negligent. So we have to make sure the nurse is aware. And if they are not having a bowel movement every three days on that third day, you got to call nurse. You got to have somebody medical that we're going to go in and do an enema or we sending you out to the doctor or, or, or something. So that is something serious. I thank you for even sharing that um, because a lot of people don't know how serious that is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, after writing this book, um, what would you like for other women to take from reading after reading, you know, reading this book, what is it that you want other women to take from it? You know, for, for that question, not just, not just women, but people in general, general, because men and women read my book, you know, read my book. Okay. But, you know, I, I always, I tell the one thing I want people, the most important thing I want people to take away from it, whether they're male or female is that never be ashamed of your truth. Never be ashamed of it. If you want to tell, tell. You never know, you know, ever never feel alone ne and never feel alone because, you know, there's somebody out there who may experience something similar or not the same thing that you've gone through in your past. You know, never let it, your past affect your future. And those, right. those are very important. And, and I agree with you. And, and we discussed that yesterday too. Um, for a long time, um, I was ashamed to even say that I was a teenage mom. And I felt like as long as I kept that in darkness, 
um, that kept a stronghold on me. So now I feel like anything that has a stronghold on me, once you give it light, it can no longer hold you in bondage. And so I'm, I'm glad you even shared that. So now I tell everybody, I'll be 52. I have a son, 37. You do the math. You do the math. And then I tell my son, you be careful because we're only 15 years apart. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean that you're going to take care of mommy. Mommy is a diva. Mama may have to take care of you. So, <laughs> you know, you live right because we're 15 years apart. But back in the day, I would have never shared that. I would have never said that. You know, I will always tell people I have a son. Never told my son age um, because I, I was afraid people would do the math. But um, it's OK because he wasn't my mistake. He was my motivation. And so he he pushed me into where I am today. So you're right. You have to give light to it. And so I'm hoping other readers that are going through things that are experienced things um, will share you know, share their experience or give light to their darkness, because once they give light to it, it can no longer hold them, uh, you know, a stronghold over them. It can no longer hold them in bondage. That's OK, so my next question. What's next for the author, Angela Chapman? What, what do you have going on now? What are you planning on doing from here on? Well, I'm actually working on my um, next book project. OK, so, I'm working on that. And then um, I the I also had the writ, you know, wrote and direct my first documentary, which is based on the book as well. So it's actually off to the film festival is being judged now. So um, I actually went in and did some editing to it before I sent it over there. And then as far as events, upcoming events for me, um, the Ball Truth, I'm actually doing a grand opening July 10th for those who live in the Dallas Fort Worth area in Louisville, Texas. In the Music City Mall in Louisville, um, they're going to. It's going to. My book actually be in the bookstore there, and then I'll be in Houston July thirty first on a book signing. Okay, great, great. Okay, tell our listeners if they want to order the book. Um, what's your platform? How they can get in contact with you? Um, like you said, you're doing a lot of things. You, you know, you're a ghostwriter. I may have to reach out to you to finish this book I'm writing. Um, so, so it's all about networking. So um, tell our listeners, you know, how they can reach you, how they can obtain the book um, and, and what's your platform. They can purchase the book, uh, The Ball Truth by Angela Chapman on Amazon.com. And as far as contacting me, they can contact me on at The Ball Truth on Facebook. Or they can contact me um, actually author Angela Chapman dot com, which is my website. Okay. So purchase the book. And then I wanted to piggyback and say something because I remember earlier you held up the copy of the book and said that you thought one thing when it's actually was something else. And there was a reason for that. I wanted to throw that in there is that the reason why um, the book up so people can see it. Yeah, yeah, the reason why. Yeah. So when people see that, and there and there's a reasoning oh. behind that. And so that there, there's this saying that says, never judge a book by its cover. Yes, so true. So that's why I did that. Mm -hmm. Well, and you had me totally fooled. Uh -huh, me too. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. I, I, I have a question, Tawana. It, um, I, only, I, I know we didn't want to give the readers um, a lot of what's in the book. But I want to make sure that our viewers, I want to make sure our viewers actually walk away with why they need to order your book. So your book encompasses a lot of things. Your book talks about sexual abuse at a very young age. Your book talks about the dynamics of the black family and how we do keep stuff under the rug. We don't bring it to light. We don't, we don't shame the individuals that should be shamed for preying on young um, children, whether that's male or female. So your book touched on that. Your book also touched on the dynamics of being a single mother, um, having a son that was battling different types of uh, mental um, you know, challenges that also pushed him to the suicidal side of it. Tawana talked 
great deal about how um, I know Tawana and I have adult children. So we also understand that as kids grow up, they tend to become very private. They even start developing knowing how to give us two different faces. The mm -hmm. face of let me show mom and dad that everything is good, I'm okay. But what they might be showing their friends or even in the dark to themselves is completely different. So your book touches on that too, which is a very unique dynamic that a lot of I think our viewers could identify with as well. And then I did still want to see if you could just go a little bit more into your the health side of it, because what I took away from your book, I've experienced um, molestation at a young age. It didn't go on very long. It was, it was a very small, you know, but it still had an impact on me. Right. Um, dealing with, uh, you know, my, my children definitely getting of age and trying to make sure that I stay connected with them. But what I couldn't identify with is obviously the health challenges that you're going through. I didn't even know, Angela, there was a name for it. I didn't know how could somebody even survive from this. I think that even collectively as women, one of the things that we talked about on our trip, and I think it's almost universal, that regular um, number two bowel movements is not the norm for a lot of women. I know for me, I don't get it until I'm not regular to <laughs> my cycle. Yeah. And then that's almost like since I don't, I don't get like cramping, I don't get anything that really kind of tells me my cycle's coming on anymore. Mine is all of a sudden I'm regular at going to the bathroom, right? So that, that gives me my indication. But I think that's one of the things, if you will at least expand on just kind of what started happening, what got you to the doctor. Your book really does a great job of really even talking about how poor our health care system is. How many times you had to go back and forth to the doctor? You were right. going to not just a general practitioner. You were going to specialists. That, that had went to school and probably got a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars in student loans because they're supposed to know when somebody like you walks in with these symptoms, immediately be able to say, This is what you have going on. So, I just really kind of wanted to make sure that we covered it because we got to make sure that our viewers know why they need to go and read and order your book. So will you kind of like really explain just even the, the medical side of it? I don't even know how to pronounce it. That's why I'm not even trying to say it. So put a, put a name to it so that these women or, or men too that might be experiencing this know exactly how to intelligently go to the doctor and say, you know what? I was on Boss Chicks at Houston platform and <laughs> an author up there that said she was going through this and I think this might be my problem and here are the words that I can express why. Yeah, it's actually um, because it's so rare and but that wasn't I didn't I didn't even give them that room for because they're just because like you said they were the specialists and they've gone to medical school I didn't give them the room to like keep telling me well because it's rare I don't know what it is I that that's unacceptable because I was mm -hmm. constantly as you read in the book constantly paying co-pays and and you know they're just being passed around like some woman on the street corner you know they didn't even think you know take my health into consideration it and and no one ever thought about at any point in time my colon was so impacted, it could rupture at any time. Once the toxins from the rupture had got into my bloodstream, I was immediately gone. And one of the, one of the, you know, one of the surgeons in the actual book, in the actual book, in the book, you know, I talk about that. He, he just said, I, I don't know why you're wasting your time coming here. It's only a matter of time before you're going to, you're going to just die anyway. So it's going to rupture, get on out of here. And that just took me over over the edge, but it's actually colonic inertia with dysmotility. Mm. And so a lot of people, like I said, they it's so because it's so rare and it falls in the category with the colon disorders and diseases, they really don't spend a lot of time. You have to really, really have a very elite specialist, you know, just like mm -hmm. the regular. I think the colorectal surgeons and specialists would know this, but they didn't. So that's why, you know, it took me all the way to the point to where I was fecal vomiting before anybody would even pay attention, would even try to help me, right. you know. So then it got to the point where because they went so long without it being diagnosed and getting the help that I needed at the time that I needed it, 
Um, I live life now without a colon. Um, my whole pelvic floor is gone. Rectum, anus, everything has been surgically removed. All my insides are gone. And I'm left like with life permanently wearing a bag. That's how I use the restroom now mm -hmm. to remove the waste from my body. Do, do you feel that if, obviously it not being rare, but if there was, like when you look back on your journey, is there anything that you say, well, I wish I would have known this or what could I have said or done that would have got them quicker, you know, to a diagnosis? Because is it possible that if it had gotten a quicker diagnosis that you wouldn't be where it is now, where it pretty much, like you said, almost a, a lot of the insides, you know, in your body is gone. Do you think that's possible? I think that um, we would have had to go back to when I was a child mm -hmm. um, because, you know, parent if your parents as a parent you would have to recognize this in your children mm. um, but you know for me i i am um, i because i have a son you know because of that we are as parents we want to have one at that time our children in the bathroom that time to be private but i think mm -hmm. as parents, we need to actually have that part of our where we can have that conversation how often are you going to the bathroom number mm -hmm. one to because you know I had urology problems where you know I have to do catheterization I have to do catheterization number one and I wear a bag number two so you know it, it can you don't have to just you have to know as a parent not just when somebody's like violating them or anything like that but how often are they going to the bathroom because it's not something I openly ask my son and now mm -hmm. he has a colorectal disorder um where he has to do a catheterization in order for him to be able to go to the bathroom to number two I didn't ask I didn't until he was in the bathroom and he was screaming and I went in there and I saw blood on the floor come from his rectum. It wasn't until then I seek medical attention from him, but I never thought to ask him how often was he going to the bathroom. So, you know, we, we need to start when they're young. Yeah. Because if I had, it had been caught when I was younger, it only got worse but as my once I became an adult. Is it her? Did, are they saying that is it hereditary or is again it's just a one in a you know hundred million or something like yeah. that? Is it it's, they're just saying right now it's just and you know if it's I I I've often tried to find out the you know the nature of it how far back it goes if it's just not just me and my son because it has a you know generations before okay. us. Mm -hmm. But when you're in that going up in that south thing, and people don't want to talk about that that's past, right. you know, so that's what I'm up against. I was up against that. You know, nobody wants to talk about that. I don't. I know it was never on the level. I never remember anybody being in the hospital for it. But if they had, you know, constipation, probably the constipation problems or problems with that, there was not something that was discussed as a family unit. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The generations prior to me. So as I say, a lot of this stuff that the cycle, we, we can stop it, you know, but the secrets have to be told. Yeah. And I think a lot of it too, growing up in the South, you, you know, you really, you're not ed well educated. You, you, you don't know a lot. And so even when you didn't have a bowel movement or they, you constipated, the first thing, you know, they tell you drink warm prune juice. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that, that was the remedy for, for, for everything. And, now, you know, when I think back, I've been constipated and battling constipation for years. Mm -hmm. And when I even inquired and asked my doctor, um, my, my PCP, the first thing she said, where a female's body, our organs are so compacted till that's normal where you don't use it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, when you don't know, you don't know. And then even with your children, I never thought, you know, all my kids are grown, but I never thought to ask them one time, are you constipated or how often are you you having a bowel movement? Um, but I think that's something parents really, really needs to know and consider and maybe start making that part of a daily conversation. Like, how was your day? Did you use the restroom today? Um, <laughs> right. Right. Uh, or or. or or when you use the restroom, because even now with our patients, you know, we teach our staff to not only for the ones that are higher functioning, tell them not to flush the toilet. You need to be able to look to see. Um, so we'll be able to be able to describe um, what type of bowel movement is it solid, is it runny, you know, what color it is. So we can kind of, because you can pick up a lot of signs from there. And so 
now being that I'm in the healthcare field, I look for a lot of things like that. But when I was growing up, I didn't know that either. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's yeah. true. So it's important, you know, it's important that you do it, you know, with our children, even if they're adults, you know, we still have, we still communicate with them, you know, just seeing if they're going so that, you know, we can start to stop the, you know, because say it is, if we don't, then that cycle continues. You're right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I commend you, Miss Angela. Mm-hmm. You did. Yeah. I still got <laughs> such a beautiful <laughs> smile on your face. Life is still just, you know, a bed of roses. And, mm-hmm. and I imagine you definitely have your ups and downs, but you are you can tell that you radiate just since mm-hmm. Tawana introduced us to you. I also want to tell everybody, our boss chicks, that, uh, you know, women that are following up, when we talk about how not just uplifting women, um, but also trying to make sure that we feed into them, whether we know them directly or indirectly. Tawana did an amazing thing. She actually challenged us boss mm-hmm. chicks to purchase 10 of Angela's books and gift them to 10 of our closest friends, girlfriends, sisters, mothers, aunts, um, to share the information and also support another boss chick. So Tawana, thank you for that challenge. Um, it was a great book. And <laughs> Angela, we shipped them to Angela. She um, personally mm-hmm. autographed everybody's book and send it out. Um, I see that Tasha, Tawana's sister, mm-hmm. she's read the book. Tracy read it. She read it in five hours. She couldn't put it down. Tasha said, I read it in a day. Um, mm-hmm. So I know all of my girlfriends that I sent it to, I checked on them. I was like, don't you put that book in no drawer. You gotta <laughs> read that book. I made them take quizzes. I said, what happened in this chapter right here? Just so I knew that they did it, but I was happy to report everybody enjoyed the book and what they walked away with was, um, you one, you never know somebody else's story, right? And number two, it also gave a lot of us a new appreciation for Mm -hmm. our life and for just having certain abilities that we don't realize other people may not have. Um, so thank you for that. It was a good inspiration. Yes, yes, it was. Yes, it was. Yes, thank, it you. Was. thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. So look, all the listeners out there, y'all better go buy that book. Yes. Yes. That. Yes. Right. Let us know. Let us know. Let us know. Yeah, it was a good one. It yeah. was a good book. Once you once you started, you you could not put it down. Um, I just wanted to keep reading and reading and was hoping everything would get better. And then once things got a little better in one chapter, then you just suck a puck at you mean another one. I was like, come on, Angela, come on, come on. <laughs> And Angela, they call me the prayer warrior, baby. When I say I read your book and you should have felt those prayers going up. I would just grab that book and bring that book to my heart, to my soul, and just fall to my knees and just cover you. And I'm like, God, you got to make it better for her. But one thing I can say, you truly do not look like what you've been through. No, you have. I do not like what you've been through. And thank God for that. Mm-hmm. Yes. yes. The one thing I really pride myself on doing, I said I would never, ever, ever, ever make sure I would never do that. You know, because so many people have, you know, they've read the book, have reached out and said how it has inspired them and things like that, you know, encourage them. And and I said, you know what, if I look like what I've been through, then, you know, it'd be a t- totally different, totally different story. Because you want to bring other people down with you. You know what I'm right. saying? Right. So, you know, I have to stay uplifted and I want them to be uplifted as well. And I'm encouraged. I want them to be encouraged. I'm inspired. I want them to be inspired. So you give off what you want to give back. That's what mm-hmm. I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being part of our platform tonight. Um, I normally answer with the prayer. I end it with the prayer, but we just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, Thank you for being raw. Thank you for being authentic. Thank you for being a boss chick. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, I'm going to pray for us and then we're in. 
Oh, heavenly gracious Father, Lord, we just want to thank you. Lord, we just want to thank you for this day, Lord, because this is a day that we're never seen and we'll never see again. And Lord, we just want to thank you. Thank you for this platform. Lord, we just want to thank you for Angela. Thank you for her health. Thank you for her strength. And most of all, Lord, thank you for the peace of mind that you continue to give her, Lord, because she could have given up long time ago, Lord. And Lord, the scars and the battles that she went through, Lord, are just testimonies to just show the world that you're real and you're true, Lord. Lord, we ask that you continue to lift her up, continue to give her wisdom, continue to give her strength. Lord, continue to just let her use her for your purpose, Lord. And Lord, that this book will not only reach just us, Lord, but that this book will reach people in state, internationally, Lord, that this will be a testimony to show that you are God and you are God alone, Lord, that you are Alpha and Omega and you are who you say you are. Lord, we're just thanking you right now. We're thanking you for this day. We're thanking you for this platform. I thank you for these ladies, the boss chicks of Houston, who I love dearly, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for the radio station that allow us to come to you and come to the world every Monday to share our stories and to in uplift and empower other women. And Lord, I thank the listeners too that are listening that this book has said something to them, Lord, that they will continue and they will reach and they will look at their families, Lord, to try to see what's going on. And then they will share their stories with others. And Lord, I just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 They're going to church. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you all so much, and I love you all dearly. Thank you. Thank Good you. Night. Bye. Bye. The ball truth. <laughs>